Oliver Stone, world-famous film director, producer, screenwriter, documentary maker, joins me one-on-one -on -one as our special guest. Hello, I'm Arnold Nido, and this is The Heat. Stone, the multiple Academy Award winner, has directed some of Hollywood's major films. He took on the Vietnam War in Platoon. He's made films about three U.S. presidents, including a look at the Kennedy assassination in JFK. And he explored the controversy over U.S. surveillance in Snowden. He's also directed, produced, and narrated a TV documentary series called the untold history of the United States. In addition, Stone has a deep interest in Cuba, and he's interviewed its former leader, Fidel Castro, for the documentary, Looking for Fidel. And as Cuba marks the 60th anniversary of the failed CIA-led invasion of its country by Cuban exiles at the Bay of Pigs in April 1961, Oliver Stone joined me for a discussion that focused on US foreign policy. Oliver Stone, thanks so much for joining us. Hello, Anand. Long time. Yes, it has been a long time. Let's start with that infamous Bay of Pigs invasion that we're talking about. That was back in April 1961. It's been 60 years. Fidel Castro at that time had not been in office for a very long time. John F. Kennedy was only a few months in office at the White House. Um, how much was the CIA and the U.S. government involved in leading that group of mercenaries at the Bay of Pigs? Well, it's quite a story. I was a young man, I, 60 years now. God already, I was about 14 years old. And uh, it was a big event in American story because he was a new president. He was young. He was a whole change, a generation, a new frontier. And within a few months of his inauguration in January, he was basically sandwiched. Uh, I mean, what was going on in Cuba was a much deeper story than the American public knew. All we saw was a surface, and we saw the Bay of Pigs invasion, which was a disaster. Kennedy was, was at first much criticized for it because the people didn't know what had happened. It was a mess. It was a, I think you know, I don't know if you want me to go into the, you know, the, the invasion itself. There was about uh, 1,500 exiles, at, and about 1,000 uh, were captured, 1,100 were captured and 115 or 20 were killed. So it was a mess and the Cubans were ready for it. The uh, Castro government was quite ready for it. They knew it was gonna happen. And uh, the world, the, the European countries especially led the charge calling the United States. This behavior of this new president was criminal. It was outside the UN. It was American inspired, American supported, but the CIA had deniability. They said this was not an American uh, coup or attempt of an, a coup. It was uh, Cuban exiles, uh, Cuban exiles trying to regain their country. Of course, they lived in Florida, most of them, and the invasion was staged from there, but also from Guatemala. And the United States did support it in many ways. Uh, among them, they had their, air we had eight, eight airplanes that flew over Cuba a couple of days before and knocked out about half the Cuban Air Force. So the United States was involved, although they maintained deniability. But it was an embarrassment. I would say overall a world embarrassment. Kennedy was to blame, uh, and uh, he was ashamed. And he was, a, he was, a, as you know, I'm, I'm an admirer of him. And the, he was not a man who was happy about this. He was very upset privately, but publicly he took the blame, took the responsibility as the leader of the country, he called himself the, off an office, the officer of this government. He was responsible. He'd been a military man in World War II. So behind the scenes, I, uh, you know, he was extremely upset, shared. A, a lot of this stuff came out afterward, not now. Uh, we didn't know it at the time. He blamed the CIA because the CIA had made a, misestimated the resistance to the exiles. The exiles thought that Apparently, the CIA gave Kennedy the idea that the exiles would be supported by the local population, but they were not. 
at all. The, the revolution was popular. Castro was mo very popular and remains so, basically, although he has a lot of criticism. Still, 60 some years later, his brother has just stepped down from office. And uh, you know, the, the Cuban leader has been one of those characters in, in history that have been larger than his critics, larger than his critics. However, uh, Kennedy vowed to, quote, shatter the CIA into a thousand pieces. He's, he knew who the enemy was. He knew in, the inside, he knew the problems of the, gov the CIA going back to the 1950s because he had been a critic of the Eisenhower administration and particularly of John Foster Dulles, the Secretary of State, for his intervention, his policies around the world in in um, Guatemala, in Iran, in Indonesia, he'd seen the, the growth of this spy agency and the Pentagon too in uh, counter-revolutionary uh, counter activities, call them, and was critical of them in the 50s as a senator. However, when he became president, this is a tightrope, and of course people will always say Kennedy was a, was a cold warrior, he had to be in order to be elected. He had to be. So he had to. He had to. He had to walk very carefully with the CIA. But uh, we know from the 1950s that the power of the CIA under the Dulles brothers was growing and growing into a. It was becoming a major force in American life. And as you know, I'm a critic of it. It's continued <laughs> for 60 years. It hasn't. Although Kennedy managed to cut the budget and managed to. Actually, he did, he did quite a bit of things, but he fired Dulles, who was the head of the agency, as well as his number two and his number three man. And most important of all, he tried to pass, he, he put out a memorandum insisting that all CIA officers abroad in foreign countries, all of them, would have to report to the American ambassador in that country, that they no longer could operate autonomously, which they had been doing. So that was a huge thing. It was the nev he was never able to enact it. It was it was uh, a memorandum. It was ignored by a lot of the CIA people, and because he was assassinated within two and a half years, it was uh, ultimately uh, withdrawn and reversed by Lyndon Johnson, his successor. Right. Uh, this was an attempt, Oliver, at what we now call regime change, uh, and it was not the last time that there was an attempt on the life of uh, Fidel Castro, nor an attempt to overthrow his uh, socialist government. Uh, in your documentary, Looking for Fidel, you interviewed Castro. You talked about the assassination attempts. Um, what did he say to you? And did he say, did you get a sense of how determined the US government was on getting rid of him? Oh, yeah. The United States government doesn't give up. Once they, once they instituted the embargo, which economically hurt the Cuban Cuban people enormously and has grave consequences and has been condemned by at the UN how many times, how many years, how many different countries. I think three countries defend the United States, Israel, the Marshall Islands, or whatever it was. Anyway, one of these protectorates, we don't have much support for it. And, uh, but the United States ignores the UN and continues the embargo, as well as all the soft power attempts, the you know, the, the dirty game, the, uh, there's a lot of dirty pool plays, but above all, the United States has cut off the trade abilities of the Cuban government. They have existed solely at originally because of the Soviet Union, but after the Soviet Union uh, dissolved in 1991, the Cubans no longer had a support system, but they have survived. It's an amazing story, but you could go and look at Venezuela too and see another country nearby that has also survived in spite of the United States hostility. As to the assassination attempts, what I found out over the years, and I didn't know this back when I made the movie, there were, they, according to Fidel, there was some 50 or so attempts against him. Fidel was a very courageous man. He laughed about it. He didn't, he didn't take it, like he was, a bit, he was above it. He knew who the enemy was. He'd been a guerrilla leader. He'd been a fighter. He'd taken on the Batista government, and now he was taking on the biggest country in the world. And he wasn't scared. He wasn't scared. He was a bold man. Sometimes when 
you could say a little bit foolish, but uh, he survived those attempts. And there were apparently the CIA, the mafia was also, also the American mafia was involved. They hired them. Uh, all those attempts failed. There was attempts by Cubans inside yeah. Cuba that were supported by the uh, United States. And none of them succeeded. But this is important. As far as I know now, there is not one document that exists that proves that Kennedy knew about those assassination attempts. The, assassin, the attempt to get rid of Castro started under Eisenhower in 1959, when Dulles, John Foster Dulles and, uh, and Eisenhower instituted the policy. Dulles died, the older brother, but the younger brother continued at the CIA, right. Alan Dulles. Those attempts continued, but the president, they, they did so illegally without the consent of the president. It was off the record. It was an implausible deniability. There's no, we cannot find a link where Kennedy ever said, go ahead and kill him. We can't. Now, he did, he did approve Operation Mongoose, but he did not approve the assassination attempts. Looking at the big picture, Oliver, um, the Bay of Pigs in 1961 took place at the height of the Cold War. Uh, the United States says that it felt threatened by the Soviet Union. Um, can you explain the U.S. worldview at that time and why the U.S. felt that it could intervene anywhere in the world? What, do you, what makes me at that time? What makes it not true today? Uh, the United States still feels it has the right to pretty much go anywhere and do anything as long as nobody knows about it and we have plausible deniability. The CIA is still stronger than ever. It survived all these attempts to squash it, to cut its budgets. It's gotten stronger over the years. There has been a temporary setbacks, no stopping. Every country of the world, we have stationed CIA chiefs, stations, and uh, a fountain of information. I mean, this is now because of cyber. Well, I, I can get into a whole thing about this, a whole new programs, but the point is the CIA, nothing happened. They got bigger and stronger and more muscular. But we weren't threatened because when Kennedy got into office, the first thing he did was uh, he had his Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, run a check on the numbers of uh, what was the missile gap. He, he, you know, he campaigned on the idea that there was a missile gap, that the Russians were stronger than we were in some areas of the military. It proved not to be true at all. They had a limited limited capacity, nuclear capacity. We had something like uh, several thousand, 2,000, I think, uh, I'm not sure exactly, 2,000 nuclear uh, bombs, and the Russians had about 200. So it's a 10 to 1 ratio at that point, roughly. And they, the Soviets did not have the ability to go head to head with the United States. And that was proven during the Cuban Missile Crisis when Khrushchev pushed it too far and we, we, uh, it became almost a World War III situation. What happened, of course, was very sad, but as a result of the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, the, uh, the Soviet Union backed down, essentially, and they decided then and there that they would, they would build up their nuclear capacity to parity. And that's what they did. They started in from the late 60s into the 70s, they built to parity. And the United States, at this point in 1962, right after the Bay of Pigs, they had, we had such superiority that many of our generals in, in the Joint Chiefs of Staff, including Curtis LeMay and Lyman Lemnitzer and, and uh, well, many of them, you know, Wheeler of the Air Force, Powers of the Air Force, I'm sorry, uh, Thomas Powers, wanted to bomb the Soviet Union then and there. They wanted to have a showdown and get it over with because we had such superiority. We could absorb casualties. That's what they said. So, but what we didn't know when we, when well, it would have been a very close, it would have been a real, I think it would have been a humdinger because the Soviets actually put nuclear missiles into Cuba. Right. We didn't know about it. We found out about it years later. McNamara told us in 1990s that he didn't know that there was like a, a hundred nuclear missiles, land-based uh, nuclear missiles in Soviet arms, in, so in Soviet hands in Cuba. So if we'd gone ahead with that invasion in 62, there would have been 100,000 American casualties at least. And then I, who knows what would have happened. Cuba would have been destroyed 
and in the, in the equation, you know, uh, it could have turned into a nuclear conflagration. Then there was the intervention in Vietnam. Uh, you were involved in that, of course. You served in the United States Army in Vietnam. Uh, and if we look at all the other places that the U.S. intervened in, why has the United States failed so many times to take away any lessons? We have taken away so, some lessons. I mean, the fact is that we never... The Bay of Pigs was so evident that we were supporting the uh, the, the exile force uh, that we then we, we no longer used proxy armies unless we did so very very uh, subtly. In other words, we went to soft power. We went through other means to change governments through rigging elections, through money, through buying. Uh, buying people in, inside the government or collaborators who, of these governments who would work with us to get rid of the president of Chile and not make it look like an American intervention. That was the, that was the way we went about it. We ended up intervening. I mean, in the Kennedy era, there was at least 60 covert attempts to uh, change governments, economic, what they called soft power cybers, using cyber, uh, cyber warfare as a as they are doing now, using economic means primarily to change governments, putting and sometimes sanctions, like with Iran and North Korea, and now yeah. Russia and China, and probably China. So uh, we have abandoned the direct military method, and we have tried to hide our foot our footprint. Unfortunately, we have a big bear, and we, our footprint is a big one. And you mentioned that, uh, you know, the intervention, you mentioned Venezuela a moment ago, that intervention continues uh, in Latin America. Um, you have captured some of that in your film, uh, Salvador. Uh, when we look at the thousands of people who are fleeing from Guatemala, from El Salvador, um, can some of that be attributed to U.S. policies in the region? Of course, this is a huge factor. We've always supported in Central America, particularly, and also South America, the right wing. The, uh, tended to be dictators or military people because they're stable and we feel that we can count on them. We've always been scared of the left-wingers, people who want, are talking about land reform, uh, talking about social reform. Uh, this is the scariest thing for us because that brings in instability and America, North America, likes to, wants to, economically, you have to understand the resources of South and Central America have been flowing into the United States for years. The United Fruit Company had a huge play in uh, Guatemala and uh, in Cuba. We own Cuba pr practically outright since, uh, what was it, 1906? I th well, whatever. We helped the Cubans with their revolution against the Spanish in 1898. And if you remember, we had a war and we sent R T Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders and soldiers to Cuba to help liberate it. They liberated it, but like in the Philippines, they stayed. Wherever we go to help the, uh, the, the, the forces of change, we stay. Same thing happened after World War II. We stayed in Japan. We stayed in Korea. We stayed in, uh, we stayed in uh, Germany and in Italy. We tend to stay, but we haven't moved. So, uh, Oliver, if we look at the world right now, it's changed quite a bit since the world uh, Cold War, hasn't it? I mean, China is now a major power. It's the world's second largest economy, for one. In the United States, there is talk here of a pivot to Asia. We've heard that before. Uh, does it concern you that there is now talk in the United States, and it doesn't matter which party is in power, there is talk of containing China? Of course, it, it bothers me. It's been going, it, it, it's, it bothers me, but it bothers me no more than it, the Ukraine bothered me, the United States. Uh, typical in typical action, and it was successful. Had a provoked a coup d'état in Ukraine off of Maidan in 2014. Very well done. We spent a fortune, according to the Under Secretary of State, six billion dollars were spent in Ukraine to make Ukrainian a Western country, which is not going to be, but that's what they want it to be. As a result, we're at the edge of war. Uh, in China, they have not made those big moves yet, but certainly the United States, the pivot, what you call the Obama's or Hillary Clinton's pivot to Asia has been a bit exaggerated, but certainly our battleships, our, our carrier forces are all over that, that region. From Japan, 
to North to Korea, Japan, Korea, down to Australia. Hopefully, we hope Vietnam, we are and Thailand. Uh, although they all resist putting more and more weaponry in, they're all we we're trying to make a satellite, a, a linkage of all these countries to encircle China, and that China is correct in saying we've been encircled. That's part of why they. They've created, they've made such a fuss about these islands and these shales in the South China Sea. And I think it's a very, we're very aggressive about the way we position ourselves as containing, fighting for peace, fighting for democracy. Sometimes we have points. I mean, there are points to be made in the Chinese situation. Certainly, it's not all clear, but the concept of ringing, of encircling Russia, encircling China is coming true. It has happened in, in the last 10 years. Uh, and one other big development that's been making news over the last few days, and that is uh, President Biden's announcement that he will be withdrawing all U.S. troops from Afghanistan uh, later this year. 2021, of course, marks the 20th year of that war in Afghanistan. Uh, as you look back at the military engagement there, was it justified? I mean, the initial justification for the invasion was to defeat the Taliban, to get rid of al-Qaeda and its leader, Osama bin Laden. That was achieved pretty quickly. But the United States is still there 20 years later. It was achieved right away, actually, in the first month or two of the war. Uh, the CIA actually did it. And uh, they went in and they did a hell of a job of routing, with the help of the northern tribes, uh, they, of routing the, uh, the so-called al-Qaeda element, but also the Taliban. Now, as you know, the Taliban and al-Qaeda are not the same thing. And Taliban were thinking, actually, of ousting al-Qaeda in that period of time because they were also concerned about their activities. The United States had so, several opportunities to make a deal with uh, Taliban through Iran, actually. Iran negotiated on our behalf, but we rejected all those opportunities. That was a George Bush administration. He was a hard head. He was not very subtle. And as a result, he, he wanted a war. He wanted a war. It was the global war on terror. And, you know, to this day, you have to wonder why these events devolved the way they did so quickly. And how come this uh, strict legislation was passed in the United States that so suited the, uh, suited the war party, the, uh, the hawks. Uh, this is a, the Patriot Act, among other things, the, the concept of closing down America and civil rights and acting and uh, uh, eavesdropping on the entire population comes out of this moment in time. And I think historians are going to go back and really question if this was a false flag operation, if 2001 itself in some way was not. I mean, I'm still having a problem, I'm sorry, with the buildings falling down the way they did and for the three buildings. It's just a lot of that situation is bizarre to me. And uh, I haven't gone there because, you know, I've made enough trouble in my life. But uh, it's an ugly, ugly story. You mentioned uh, Ukraine a moment ago. And of course, we see these tensions rising in that part of the world. There are also tensions, of course, rising between Russia and uh, the United States. You spent hours interviewing President Putin. Um, the United States accused President Putin of interfering in the 2016 election, uh, also accused him of uh, having something to do with the 2020 election. Um, what is your view of that relationship right now between the United States and Russia? It's a, it's a, I'm sorry, it's a tragedy. It's all, the United States has never presented convincing proof of this intervention by the Russian government. I don't see why they would. Uh, they would monitor the election, but they would to intervene and try to change the vote. To me, uh, smacks of some movie fantasy, Hollywood fantasy of the bad Russians again coming to America. Uh, and every time we need a trope, uh, something to feel that someone's to blame, but not ourselves, we, chant, we, 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 we name the Russians. Uh, it's a James Bond movie. And I never, I, I mean, many Americans agree with me. It's, it's not intelligent. And from what I know of Mr. Putin, those interviews, he's certainly an intelligent man. And he does, he's not looking for uh, conflict with the United States. It doesn't make sense. The United States is a huge power. It's true. Russia has a tremendous nuclear force and can match us, at least in a, 
in a in a real a real war. They are they're very good at what they do with very little money. They have one twentieth our budget, one twentieth of the military budget, and they've managed to keep pace. But but it's not for them a winning proposition. It's much more in Putin's interest to make his economy stronger and to trade and and make make allies with Eurasia and China, healthy trade. And I think China wants the same thing. I don't see them setting out to destabilize the United States. That is an American fantasy that we're being, we're being attacked by someone who does economically well, uh, that we cannot be the top dog. We cannot be always number one. When we hear uh, President Biden talk of withdrawing troops from Afghanistan after a 20-year war, do you think that's some kind of reckoning? Because if we look at the United States' involvement around the world, look at the invasion of Iraq, the United States also led that assault on Libya as well. That resulted in the destabilization of an entire region, millions of refugees. Do you think there is a reckoning right now? What's your view on that? No, there's no reckoning. It means it, it's nothing. It's... Frankly, this so-called withdrawal of troops is, is a bit of a sham because you pull out the land troops, but we still have major contractors there. We have air, air power. We could send in bombers anytime we want if there's any kind of threat. We have tremendous assets that can protect Afghanistan, as so-called, and destroy Taliban movements. And we, we will do that. It's not like we're withdrawing like in the sense of Vietnam. Uh, even there, when we pulled out, we had Vietnamization. We were supporting the Vietnamese government with a hell of a lot of bombs and money. So, I mean, what difference does it make if you have 2,000 men there or you have uh, your air force in the Persian Gulf and your naval destroyers ready to jump on Afghanistan if necessary? We also have built up quite an infrastructure there and it's all wasted, but... Uh, it was a mess. It was a tragedy because we, we could have withdrawn very easily those troops we had back in 2002, but to Bush didn't want to. He wanted to go to, he, he wanted to leave them there, but he didn't want to reinforce them. He wanted to go to Iraq, which had nothing to do with 9-11. Uh, it, it, it's a very strange Alice in Wonderland nightmare that's been going on for 20 years if you're an American and you can see through this stuff. So. Oliver Stone, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Oliver. <laughs> Thank you very much. And that's it for another edition of The Heat. Thanks for joining us.